up for too long. But basically the first thing is this. Uh, when I'm talking, I want you to really raise your awareness or around your radar, if you like, for some of the things that I say and how they pertain specifically to you. Because when I'm talking tonight, you know, this isn't actually about entertainment for you, it's about empowerment for you. So I'm wanting you to take some little, little tools or little glyphs, if you like, or stuff that you can use in your life. Okay, we've got some agreement on that? Yep. Oh good, thank you very much. Now, the second thing is, in a moment, you're going to get the opportunity to give somebody and to receive at the same time a gift. And it's a very special gift. Um, but when we do this short exercise, I'm going to ask you to do it with intent. Now, this is one of those little, little uh, treasures, if you like. Because too often in life, we go through life. We just go through the motions. We don't do things with enough intent and with enough purpose. Okay? So I'm going to, well, I was going to use the word invite, but I'm actually going to challenge you to do this exercise with intent. And what I'd like you to do is to turn to the person next to you. If you don't know their name, uh, introduce yourself, because in the words of Dale Carnegie, the sort of famous uh, North American personal development man, he's famous for writing a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And in his words, he says, remember, to that person, their name is the sweetest sound in the world. You want a little tip to be able to get on with people? Remember their name. So, you all got somebody to turn next to to be able to say this exercise to? Yeah? All right. The guy over there, yeah, no, you want to, okay. All right. So you've all got names? Awesome, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm Glenn. Yeah. And you're uh, Right on. That's not the exercise, that's just the first part of the exercise, by the way. Now what I'd like you to do, part one, now that you know their name, the second part I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look that person in the eye, because remember the eyes are our windows to the soul, and it's through looking through the eyes we connect with our heart. So you know their name, you're going to look them in the eyes, and then you're going to repeat these words after me. Well, not after me, when I tell you to. So John, Jane, whatever that person's name is, you're going to look at them and say, John, Jane, in you there is greatness. Can you do that now, please? With intent. That's awesome. Glenn, in you there is greatness. <laughs> I don't know why other people haven't seen it. <laughs> I know, I feel nice it just like right here to go. Well, yeah, you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Now my brief tonight is to talk to you for 10 minutes. So like I said, I won't hold you up for that long. And it's to talk to you for 10 minutes on leadership, and leadership particularly with regards to the environment. Now with the environment here in New Zealand or Aotearoa, we are in a truly unique and privileged position. Obviously we're an island. But here we have a different relationship with our environment to the rest of the world. We have a different relationship because the land is not separate to who we are as people, as individuals within ourselves. And our creation stories within here in New Zealand it's an evolution that has led to this physical world. And the beginning of that evolution started with the creator called Iō Matua Kore, Iō the parentless. He diversed into Iō Matua, the first parents, then to Iō Pukenga, Iō the precursor. So the precursor is what scientists call the Big Bang Theory. And then Iō continued to evolve and develop the world that we see which finally settled with what we call in Māori Dung, Te Ao Māori, this, the physical world that we can see all around us. And as he all created those layers, the last layer he created, or heaven if you want to call it that, was Ranganui, the sky father, the male element. And as men, as we all know as men, he is the protector. It is our role as men to protect those loved ones that we have around us. And he looked down below, and he saw Papa Tuanga. There's a famous Māori whakatauki that goes like this. Te heke e hoki aranga nui e tūri ho nei kia papa e tako tōkou. Papa te whātiri hiko hiko te uira e kanapu e te rangi rua nā te whenu. And basically what it means is, 
Rangunui, the male, uh, sorry, the male element, looked down below him and saw Papa Tuanuku, the female element. And as young people had been one to do since the beginning of time, they fell in love. And they had children. And these children went to become the kaitiaki or the guardians of the physical world that we see around us here in New Zealand, in Aotearoa. Tangaroa became the god of the sea. Tāni Mauta became the god of the forest. Tāwhiri Mātia, the god of the weather. Rua Aimoko of earthquakes and volcanoes. Homie Tiki Tiki, the god of cultivated fruits. Rongo Matāni, the god of culti oh, sorry, uncultivated fruits. And Rongo, the god of love and peace. And Tumatoi, the god of man. Now, these gods, Eo hadn't finished yet because they went from the godly phase to the demigods. And in our corridor here in New Zealand, Maui Tiki Tiki Aparanga, half man, half god. He who fished up the island of the North Island, Te Ka Maui. Then transitioned and evolutionized to humans, to us, to people. So the first human that was to discover this land of Aotearoa was a man named Kupe. Kukupeki Ka puta raua, ko Charles Bryce, ko Bill Bryce, ko Machi Bryce, ko And so, in my story, that creates, that completes my genealogy, my whakapapa. But just as says I have my genealogy, you all have yours. But I just told you mine to illustrate the point that in New Zealand, the land is not something innate to ourselves. It is far part of our genealogy, our whakapapa of creation that has led to us here. So as New Zealanders, I invite you, when you look around at those mountains that we see like Moa, or when you look out at a lake, I know for a fact I don't see something that is dead, something that is innate. They are all physical manifestations of my earth mother. So I invite you as New Zealanders to view the earth as part of who you are, as part of your ancestry, rather than something that is separate than yourself. Now we all saw it, and one of the videos touched on it as well, and you know, we have this perception in New Zealand of our clean green image, and I think one of the girls in that video said exactly that. I think they mark it off as 100% pure in some of the signs that I've seen. I was talking to a mate of mine the other day, and he is the regional manager for the Department of Conservation for the Central North Island, and he told me that in our low-lying streams and lakes, 80% of our rivers uh, unsafe to swim in from a bacterial point of view by international world standards. Now I can sort of understand that, you know, there's a lot of cows in New Zealand, their poo's got to go somewhere when it goes onto the ground and obviously it washes into the waters. But then when I hear stories like the sea lettuce that washes up on the Mount Beach every day, as it's been told to me, it's a result of all the fertilisers that have flushed into the rivers over time and it's manifested down on the mountain. Now I want you to ask this question now. Just raise your hand if you've ever been driving around New Zealand and you've seen rubbish dumped on the side of the road. Household rubbish. Yeah? Pretty much everyone. Yeah? Now while I can sort of understand the first two, we all need business, we all need industry, but I can't really forgive that one. That is just people that have no respect for our Earth Mother and our Sky Father. They don't view it as something that needs nurturing and protecting. So there is a real need for leadership in our world, in our society, as we see today. And those people that have made those videos, they show their leadership in that action. So leadership, Pano, is quite simply this. Leadership is influence in action. And what I mean by that is, leaders, through their words and through their actions, can basically get people to do what they want them to do. If you like, leaders manipulate people. 
They come up with an idea or an action and people will follow. Probably the most common example that pops to my mind straight away is Richie McCall and the captain of the All Blacks. Now I know for a fact, you watch those two, that rugby team, those players on that team, they would rather die than lose with Richie McCaw as captain because they know that he would rather die than lose too. And you know, just today, the All Blacks, 96% winning record, unheard of, and they just took out the, the world team of the year. Never happened before. So it shows what leadership can do, right? Now, one of my favorite movies of all time is a movie called Troy. And in it, it's got Brad Pitt and he plays the part of Achilles. And it's my favorite movie for one scene. And it's when Achilles is, is on the shore and they're coming up to the island of Troy. And this is a true story. He lived, this man. Came up with all his, and he had his men in the ship. They're coming up to the beach. And just as they're about to hit the beach, they look up onto the island with all the enemies and he turns around to all the soldiers and he says, Brothers, up there lies your greatness. Take it, it's yours. And of course all his men go charging up the beach. Still to this day, every time I see that man, I go, I'm with you, Achilles. I'm with you, brother. But the thing about this is, okay, in this modern world, we don't have shields on our arms. We don't have swords in our hands. But I tell you this, each and every single one of us in this room is in a battle. And it is the battle of life. To win means when we get laid down for the final time, we've lived the life of our dreams, a quality of life. We've got nothing left in the tank. And we're happy to go there. Now I work as a funeral celebrant. And I've seen, so I come into contact quite a lot with the brevity of life. So just make sure that you know you are in a battle. And the reward is when you go, if you go with nothing left in the tank, that's what life is all about. Because I tell you straight up, fun, the majority of people don't. Now the other thing is, just as in any battle, you need strategies and tools to win. Now I've got a whole 40 minute keynote uh, written around what those strategies are. But I haven't got time for that today. My 10 minutes is probably just about up anyway. But I would like to share with you three key ones, what I think are the top three. First is vision. Leaders have vision. Science has proven that our brain thinks in pictures, not words. So leaders have a very clear idea of where they want to go. And how the mind works as it starts to create things around how to get there. So leaders have vision. They imagine what they're wanting or how they think the world can be or whatever it is for them and they start to create it through their influence, through their words and their modelling to get a team around them that can implement change. Just as you all have done tonight, those young people that have put those videos up there. That is how you influence change. The second is around dreams. Leaders dream. They don't look at things as they are. They look at things as what they could be, as what they should be. They don't accept the status quo. They look at things and go, that's the way they should be. And they again, through their words and their influence, they implement change to enable that to happen. And finally, the last one is charge. Two things. One of my favourite speakers is a gentleman called Les Brown. He's an Afro-American. And I love the way he says it. He says, life is hard. you got to be hungry. I was at a business conference the other day and had to eat it all flavor. He's a Ministry of Mind and Development. And he gets up there at the end of the talk after watching some business owners and thinks, oh, you business owners, you inspire me. I always thought that I wanted to be in business. And I got up to him and I went up to him afterwards and I said, be careful what you wish for to do Because I'm in business myself and all I know, business is like this. There's just one mountain after another. As opposed to when you're on wages where it's a bit more of a sort of level trajectory. 
So you need to have that. The second thing is really around this word fear. Now there's an analogy for fear. Fear means fantasized experience appearing real. What it basically means is you don't do something because you think this is what will happen. Now, and legitimately, fear, you know, that's a human characteristic that we have within us, and it's a natural protection mechanism. So you think back to the caveman days, of course, there's the old caveman standing out there with his wooden stick, there's a big saber-toothed tiger in there. So that fear is saying to him, do you really want to go in there? I don't fancy your chances. So fear protects us. It's the same reason of why we're standing up to do a bungee jump or a skydive. You're standing up there and you're going, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. It's a natural mechanism of fear. Now where fear comes unstuck is that these days, not very often anyway, are we in life-threatening situations. But that fear is still part of us. So all I'm saying to you is, you have to make a judgment call when you hear that fear running up inside you around, do I really want to do this? Will it benefit me or will I not? And sometimes you have to face your fears. And I'm just going to finish with a brief uh, little story. The winner of this gets presented at TEDx um, in August. And uh, I was actually one of the speakers last year at TEDx. Now, when it came to that, I'd never done anything like that before. Like I said, I'm a funeral and marriage celebrant, so I was used to public speaking. But moving into this whole TEDx realm was a completely different scenario. Thousand people. When I went into it, I had no idea that I'd end up being making the cut to get it. By some miracle, I did. So I went away and I wrote my talk and I rehearsed. I reckon you got to do a thousand times if you get your TEDx down to it. I probably did it 1,200. By the time I hit that stage on that night, I was ready to roll. I learned it inside out, backwards, fast, slow. I had it down and I was flawless. So I walked on stage at TEDx, seen the thousand people in front of me, hit them with my opening line, and then something happened to me that hadn't happened in all of those 1,200 practices. And all of that smooth repertoire where it just flowed out for me, I forgot my next line. And I watch that video online now, and I look at it and I can see my eyes, and my eyes are just black. And because of my mind, I was freaking out. And I'm standing up there on stage in that split second, and my mind was thinking, I wonder if I can ask, if I can start again. <laughs> and just as those words were about to come out from my lips, that what did come out was the next line. And the rest of the talk was flawless. Now I was on that stage, I was one of three speakers from Tauranga, all the rest were, were from out of town, I was up against some, not against, but I was on the stage with some professional speakers, a guy called Sir Rod Avery, former New Zealander of the Year, he does speaking, he gets paid $10,000 a gig sometimes. And I had people coming up to me after that talk and saying, else your talk was the best one of the night. The next day when I sat down with my partner, she said, oh, how do you feel? I said, well, I kind of feel like I've been to the moon and back. But I've still been to the moon. In my work now, it certainly helped to get my name out there. And because I work for myself, that helps. So it certainly helped professionally in my career. But the reason I've told you that story is, you just don't know, sometimes, there's such a fine line between success and failure. But I do know this, if you don't face your fears, if you don't display those leadership qualities that I've said, you will never know. And there's enough people in this world that go to their grave with those dreams still in them. One of my favourite books is written by a guy called Wayne Bennett, who's coach of the Brisbane Broncos, and a bit of a football head. And the title of his book is Don't Let the Music Die In You. And what he means by that is, let it all hang out. When you go to the grave, go with nothing left in the tank. Because leaders are a minority. And we need followers, make no mistake. But what I am saying to you is, there's space for you to be a leader. I talk about 
personal leadership and professional leadership. We all need personal leadership. If we're going to live the life of the quality that we want to do, if we're going to discover our sense of purpose, every single one of you in this room has a sense of purpose why you've been put here to do. One of the challenges of life is finding what that purpose is. So I'm sure my 10 minutes is up, Glenn. I'm sorry if I've gone over it. But I'd just like to you now to turn around to that person that you acknowledged at the beginning and turn around to that person now, use their name, look them in the eye and say these words. I believe in you to claim your greatness. Do that now, please. I actually do. I believe in you to claim your greatness. I believe in you to claim your greatness. Thanks. Keep trying. <laughs> Okay, everybody. Thank you. And I'll just finish with this. Okay, that's a bit cheesy, eh? Turning around to somebody you don't know and saying your greatness. But hey, when you think about it, don't you really believe that we all have greatness within us? Thank you. It's been lovely to see you all. Thanks very much.